don't need to spend too much time introducing Bob. This is Bob Miller. Anyway, Dr. Miller is in Thousand Oaks, California with his wife, Debbie. And tonight, we have a lot to talk about because uh, this is a, a phenomenal career that Bob has had. And he continues to be an author and speaker. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about was Bob's book, The Revolution in Horsemanship. And one of the things that was very interesting the other day was when we were talking about the book, Bob had what I call a two eyes on me moment. And all of you that have ever asked your horse with the um, halter and lead rope to put both eyes on you, Bob said, Andrew, both eyes on me. Look at the second sentence and it's called, and what it means to mankind. And I think that that's going to be really important for where I want to emphasize today because the horsemanship is amazing. It's a, it's, it's definitely a revolution, but it's also had a huge effect on all of us that are involved. Dr. Miller, welcome tonight. Would you like to say hi to everybody? Hello, everybody. Wonderful. So, the first question I wanted to ask you is what motivated you to work with Rick Lamb to write this book? Uh, what is, and it came out 2005, it's 15 years ago. What motivated you to write this with, with um, Rick? Well, our friendship with Rick Lamb came about because he was the host, uh, MC at shows, and we established a friendship and, um, that just grew, and uh, his interest in uh, natural horsemanship. I can't remember if I suggested to him that we do a book together, or he suggested it to me. I don't remember, but we did. Uh, we did that. Wonderful, and I've always looked at one of the things that that I thought was really important was that you define in the book natural horsemanship as the general natural horsemanship that applies to everybody. And, and would you give us your definition of natural horsemanship? Well, and first of all, the, the, the name was coined by Pat Perilli, not by me. Uh, I thought about it and realized that what he meant was that there were methods of communicating with the horse, in fact, with any species but a horse in particular, and that uh, these methods lead to more effective and more humane performance on the part of the horse. And uh, it's, the methods are natural to that species. They're natural to the horse. So my, that's my interpretation of natural horsemanship. Uh, and I, I approved of it and uh, supported it ever since. Oh, it's wonderful. Well, in fact, I remember meeting you uh, through Pirelli as a student myself, and I remember Pirelli used to, uh, Pat and Linda always asked for you to, to speak if you were there and you were honored at one of the savvy conferences. And one of the things that impressed me was you stood up, uh, apparently impromptu, because you certainly didn't have any notes, and you gave us just an amazing talk. When is it that you just started to be an author and a speaker? 
it, it was after, uh, I, uh, long after I was in practice. Uh, I, I didn't do those things when I was uh, young. Uh, never thought I would uh, do anything like that. But uh, it was the desire to share information and, uh, and above all, to it, give it a rational, scientific explanation of why these methods work. They're not just uh, gesturing or style. They, they work on a horse because it's natural for the horse to understand these, these uh, approaches. So I became a supporter of Pratt Pirelli. Uh, I've heard him say how much he's learned from me, and he certainly heard me say how much I've learned from him. It's been a, a rewarding relationship. Uh, sad to say, I, I haven't seen him for a long time. It'd be nice to see Linda on the screen. Uh, I miss, uh, miss seeing them, but that's the way, that's the way life goes. Yes, well, tell us about when you met Pat at Bishop Mule Days. Yes. Yes, I'd never heard of him. But at Bishop Mule Days, uh, he was giving a, a demonstration at one of the side rings. Uh, he had a group of people there, an audience. And uh, out of curiosity, I remember Debbie was taking a break in our camper. And uh, I stood there and listened to him for about 30 minutes. And then I thought, Debbie's got to see this. She's missing something really good. So I went back there. I said, Debbie, you've got to go come hear this guy speak. I'm going to make a prediction that as the years pass, he was in his 20s at that time. As the years pass, this guy has become an important and prominent horseman. And uh, that's exactly what happened. Well, it's wonderful. And then Pat coined the phrase, you know, the term natural horsemanship. And we talked about what that was. And then one of the things that happens when you call something something, I mean, you name it, uh, you noticed that some people were very excited about the term and adopted it, and others tended to reject it. Can you talk about that? Well, I guess that comes about with any innovation, any, any new concept. Some people uh, uh, approve of it, and some people become enthusiastic supporters. Other people uh, condemn it. Uh, it's almost <laughs> any technology or idea in life, you can you can see that. Uh, so uh, I certainly didn't have any difficulty because I had actually been using uh, his methods uh, from the time I was a teenager with horses. I, I didn't give it a name and. Uh, generally didn't allow people to watch me because I thought I would be scorned or made fun of because uh, all the, uh, the, the softness, the affection, uh, the, the gentle rewards I offered and the uh, minimal adverse signals I gave them uh, if the behavior was uh, disapproved. So at first I would not allow anybody to watch what I was doing. Uh, I also knew it wasn't traditional. Uh, I was working with ranch horses and um, the, the methods that at that time, and to some extent still are, uh, what we call traditional cowboy or horsemanship, um, buck them out. And uh, of course it worked, we know it worked. But uh, while it was fast, that's the only good thing you could say about it, uh, it uh, created injuries, both mental and physical, to both the horses and the people working with them. So uh, that's why the subtitle on that book is What It Means to Mankind. Because if you apply the concepts of horsemanship in there to our human relationships, uh, it will facilitate human relationships. Well, that is most certainly the truth. It's um, had a huge impact for me since I took it up. I didn't expect that it would change things at work, 
changed things in my personal life. And you actually articulated that in the book. Um, can you expand on that, on the thought about the effect to mankind? Yeah, it, there's certain things in our genes, we humans as a species, and I understand this having worked with uh, zoo animals throughout my career, so a variety of species, and I understand the effect of evolution, and I realize that the human species, the primitive, primitive human societies, uh, there's a lot of uh, physical uh, domination mm -hmm. rather than using a convincing logic to, uh, to dominate, to use physical, use fear. Uh, it, you can see it throughout history and it certainly can see it today. Uh, instead of using logic and persuasion, uh, so many people still use, even our advanced society, uh, so many people are still using primitive methods of communicating. That would be an example, for example, of, uh, let's say, a boss and an employee. There are kindly, gentle, uh, solicitous uh, bosses, and there are uh, cruel uh, and unnecessarily assertive bosses. We've all seen that. Yes, sir. And so how do you think the horse is, has taught people? Well, if you master natural horsemanship, according to uh, Pirelli, and of course, there were people who preceded him and the, and the numerous people after him. Uh, we can name a lot of people. This is a revolution in horsemanship. You got to realize horsemanship is goes back thousands of years in human history. And uh, this movement, and we generally give credit to the originator, Tom Dorrance as the originator. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my lifetime, I've seen this go from uh, it, Pirelli's demonstration to a couple dozen people, Bishop Mule days, and realizing this guy is different, uh, to now where it's become very widespread. It's not, not 100%. Uh, things never are 100%. They'll always be stepped back in time. But, uh, the concept, the basic concepts of compassion, of uh, patience, of recognition, uh, for, and identification with the subject, whether it's a child that you're dealing with, or a fellow human being, a fellow mature human, or a horse or a dog. Uh, if we can ad adapt our feeling, put, put our emotions aside and use logical uh, methods, which if we're a good student, we can learn from these people. And I don't have to tell you, I could name 20 of them right now who are prominent in, in this movement. And we have a couple on the call, which is kind of exciting. Um, so one of the things you did talk about in the book was that this this is a movement um obviously pat pirelli had a huge influence um and you discuss him in a set of instructors who were uh, really going at the time of the book 2005 and then you had a second set of instructors that you said were the next wave which included linda who's on the call um one of the things in the book you characterize the differences and similarities of them what what can you kind of recall for us in what you learned while you were doing that? You mean at the Pirelli uh, clinic specifically? Well, I meant that it, as you as you as you talked about each one of the various clinicians that included a number of different clinicians other than Pirelli. Mm -hmm. um, we talked mm -hmm. about the seven games. Obviously, would be Pat um, and. 
then um, horse and Alley, I think, came along the way, similar with, you know, more Linda. And, but there was others. And there's a bunch of others in the book that you talk about, and they have different approaches. Um, I think you mentioned Richard Schrake. You mentioned Buck Brandeman. How did you... Uh, how do you, what were some of the things you remembered about the different kind of instruct or the different instructors? Well, having been to many, many uh, uh, horsemanship clinics, progressive, the kind of horsemanship we're talking about, I have observed that with rare exceptions, uh, the clinician does a mostly good job. But in each case, I'm not going to elaborate on them. In each case, there are little idiosyncrasies which uh, interferes with the pr procedure that they're not aware of. Uh, but they get the job done. Mm -hmm. Because, as I said, even the old methods of bronc busting got the job done for, in most cases. So, um, uh, that's the thing I enjoyed about clinics is studying uh, the people's approach and all. I'll, I won't name who I'm talking about, but for example, there's one very good clinician. Uh, and when I watched him at first, he was still a quite young man. And, uh, when he approached the round pen for the horse for the first time, he walked like a young man. Uh, he walked aggressively, uh, the, and rapidly, and with his arms swinging and deliberately, and that scared the heck out of the horse. I'm just using one example. If you saunter casually towards the horse at, at a slight angle, because facing the prey is a predatory behavior and the animal instincts that as uh, instinctively understands that as predatory so if you are your arms hang loose and you slouch a little bit and just casually walk towards the, uh, the horse it's less frightening less intimidating and less likely to precipitate a flight reaction or a defensive reaction uh, it's possible as he got older and more matured, uh, he'd slow down in his approach. But uh, I noticed other people used an extremely casual approach, and uh, uh, that's reassuring to the horse. Now, of course, I was able to apply this to uh, my patients, my equine patients, because uh, nobody has a more challenging job than the veterinarian, because you create discomfort and fear in the horse. So, uh, I hope that e explains it. Give you an example. I've got a horse, an eye problem right now. And um, it has to be treated several times a day with several different ointments. Uh, what I did the first time, because the, uh, the eye is painful, so when you touch the eye, there's a fear reaction. Well, I didn't do that. Instead, I just rubbed the face until I saw his head drop and he, his action said, oh, I was worried about that, but that feels good. And then I took the time to slowly advance my fingers. And as soon as I feel him tense up, I back off an inch or two. And so in several minutes, I was able to rub the eye, and I could see what he was saying. I thought that was going to cause pain, but it feels so good. And so the first treatment, I spent a long time just rubbing his eye. And then from there, I went to elevating the lid, squeezing the ointment in, and rubbing it some more. Now, uh, we've been treating him for weeks now. Uh, all I have to do is rub for maybe 10, 15 rubs, and he leans toward me, re ready for the treatment. So instead of creating a problem, having to put a twitch on him, or something like that, using mm -hmm. forceful, so, uh, 
because I've spoken to a lot of veterinary groups and uh, the use of tranquilizers uh, is one of the greatest advances in veterinary medicine. Uh, and I used them, although they were only one or two around when I started practice. But on the other hand, I think that they became uh, a quickie method of restraining the horse for, for treatment. Uh, if that's not good horsemanship. Well, yeah, and it's interesting because what you're describing is um, uh, is the approach and retreat, which is now being called retreat and approach, depending mm -hmm. on how where you are in the relationship with the horse. Mm -hmm. And it's it's I think that most isn't it fair to say that most of the clinicians that are, you know, following the revolution, do some sort of um, approach and retreat. Yes. I think it's a, as a fundamental, would you say that again? We, we lost you. It works. It works. It works. It works. And of course, if you allow impatience uh, to interfere with uh, your patients, uh, the horse will pick up on that immediately. There's, this is a, a prey animal. And one of the relatively few prey species that the, is not equipped with weapons like horns horn on the nose or horns on the top of the head uh, or tusks, uh, it relies upon to stay alive. It's a flight species and that which is a very effective. The horse has been very successful uh, using flight. And so if we don't acknowledge that and uh, we don't dispel the, the flight reaction and actually encourage it and say, well, you can't get away because I've got you, a hold of you. I've got you here. Uh, and that's the wrong approach. Well, yeah, because to some extent you're setting up for a fight if you're not allowing the flight, right? So the numerous tranquilizers we have today have solved that problem, mm -hmm. uh, but they, they're not necessary. In other words, yeah. we can generally use uh, natural horsemanship concepts uh, to do uh, painful procedures, medical procedures in the horse. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I'll just, one more example, for example. Sure, absolutely. When I started practice, and that was 64 years ago. When I started practice, uh, the bread and butter of horse practice was tube worming. And uh, the policy was to pass a stomach tube twice a year, uh, pump medication into them that would uh, kill most of the parasites. Wow. Uh, and it was an everyday thing, every day. And of course, some, some times of the year, you maybe half the calls of the day would be tube worming. I, using what I'd learned working with horses before I got my veterinary degree, I took the time, and it took a lot of time, to just stand there and pet the horse and until I got the horse to relax and insert my finger up into the nostril. And once they pass the fear reaction, I wiggle my finger and the horse suddenly says, oh, that scared me, but now it feels good. And so, so I see the eye softening and the head comes down and they're relaxing. And then I introduce the tube and give them the same lesson. This took a long time, but once I had them trained to the stomach tube, I was the vet who could tube them without twitching them or earring them wow. down. Wow, wonderful. It sounds so barbaric now, you know? Well, it wasn't, <laughs> it, but it worked, it did work. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The day I retired in 1987, from practice that is, the day I retired, I went to a, an English stable that had large warm bloods, a whole stable full of them. 
And I tube wormed 92 head of horses and I never tranquilized one, never twitched one, never eared one. I had them all trained. I had them all trained uh, to accept the stomach tube and accept mm -hmm. it very quietly. They did have one horse that had just come in from New England and uh, that one, uh, I had to start all over and retrain it. And I thought, I'm retiring tomorrow. <laughs> what am I wasting my time for? <laughs> well, I'm sure that horse appreciated being <laughs> the last <Sure>. one. <laughs> most of the owners did, most, most, yeah. but not all. I got yeah. criticized. I, I remember one, one guy in particular that says, why don't you quit messing around? Just put a twitch on him. <laughs> oh yeah no i hear you and it's interesting because you be going going all the way back to when you were a kid and you said that you were one of the few um people in your in your community of horse people that were choosing a gentle method or choosing and you use the term soft right well all all of us that have made that selection if we are in a environment where others are like that have felt that i remember when i was the only one with a carrot stick and a savvy string and a mm. rope halter and lead rope <laughs> and people were laughing at me right and you know what the thing though is because i'd seen the wow i wanted the house so bad i didn't care and then a few months later you know it didn't take long before because i put the time in i would they were wishing that they'd put the time in and it wasn't long, but it's, I, I, the reason I bring that up is because, because so much of it, as so many of us had to experience that. And I'm sure the professionals that are on the call have known when they have to go behind the barn to go play with the horse the way they want to, so that they don't get the criticism. It's interesting that you experienced that. Um, well, it sounds like this would be back in the thirties, right? Forties. Uh, in the 40s yeah yeah exactly yes the 40s and 50s yeah you know what it wouldn't be it wouldn't be fair if i didn't bring up imprint tra training and you wrote the book what was it that led to the book and talk to us about imprint training yeah it was 1979 <clears throat> Uh, 59. I'd been out here in practice three years. 59. What? It was 59. Yeah, 59. 1959. And um, it was uh, spring. And I had three emergency obstetrical calls, which is not unusual. In each case, there was a difficult delivery. I had to uh, re reposition the foal in the mare and then uh, pull the foal, attach your obstetrical chains to the legs, pull the foal. And uh, then of course you don't jump in the car and drive off because the, both mare and foal have been through a lot of stress. So hang around long enough to be sure they're both okay. What I like to do is see that foal on its feet and looking for milk. Then I know it, everything's okay. So I had three in one week in May of 1959. I saw the first one three weeks later, the first foal. The mare had been bred on the foal heat. And the foal was totally unafraid of me. Uh, allowed me to walk up and hit, hit, touch it. And I looked at the owner and I said, you've been working with this foal of sure gentle. No, he said, we haven't touched it since you delivered it. Now, if it had just been that one, I probably wouldn't have attached any significance to it. But a week or so later, I, I got the second one. one oh, it's longer than that. The second one was, uh, let's see, the first one was 20 some odd days. The second one was 100 days, 100 days. And the third one was four months old. Uh, and I, each time I saw how gentle they were, uh, the one fool actually came to me, recognized me and came to me. 
and I said, uh, in each case to the owner, how nice and gentle, you've been working with it? No, we haven't touched it since you delivered it. I thought, huh, I was taught in vet school and in ag school before I went to veterinary school to minimize the handling of the newborn foal. That you'll interfere with the bonding between mare and foal and you'll cause all kinds of problems. And I never questioned it. And it seemed like, and shortly after that, I read about the, the work of the Austrian scientist who first described imprinting in dogs was uh, six to seven weeks of age. In prey species like sheep, cattle, goats, horses, it's uh, at birth because if, if they don't follow mom at speed within an hour of birth, they're probably gonna get eaten by, by a, one of the big cats or one of the big wild dogs. So I thought, I'll bet that they imprinted on me because I handle them as soon as they're born. Well, I decided that what I accomplished without meaning to was imprinted myself upon the newborn foal. We had a mare that was pregnant at that time. And I decided to try an experiment, which I had been taught not to do. And that is the moment that foal emerged from the mare, I went to work on it, handling its entire body, patting its feet. Uh, I put on a gloves and I served my finger into the rectum, uh, I, up its each nostril, wiggling my fingers. And well, I knew the next day that I'd discovered something because uh, I never saw a foal so easy to handle and so gentle and so obliging. And so I did three of my own foals, one a year. And then started with my clientele. I'd go on a postpartum to see a newborn foal or to deliver one. And then I'd say, would you like to see what I'm doing with my foal? And they said, sure. They always said that. So I'd go ahead and do the procedure, which takes close to an hour. I didn't charge him for the time because I knew that foal was going to be an easy to handle patient for the rest of its life. And time proved me right. Uh, I finally wrote an article on it for the Western Horseman magazine because I wrote for them regularly back then. And thanks to the editor, Pat Close, it wouldn't have happened without her. She said, we've actually got a few people that are interested in that method. She said, now a majority think it's nonsense. I said, no, I know that. She said, we want to do a book on a subject. So you're going to have to write several more chapters. But that book, I forget the publication date, but that book, paved the way uh, for imprint training. And now it's taken a half a century to become accepted, widely accepted, not universally accepted by any means, but widely accepted in every aspect of the horse industry. And it's gonna take another 50 years before it becomes generalized. But what we found with our own horses and mules that imprint training at birth to take that hour of handling them as soon as they're born, as soon as possible after they're born, pays off for the entire lifetime. It's my greatest contribution uh, to the livestock industry. Oh, and, absolutely. And it, it's, it's well known. And people are, are pricing. Is there, if you were to if you were to write a new chapter today or, or say anything more, what would, you, what would you tell people? Well, actually, I added a couple of chapters to the Western Horseman book, Imprint Training of the Newborn Foal. So I did have some more thoughts in it. And when they reprinted the book, they put that, those in. 
and I've written, of course, in new, countless articles on it and uh, gave countless seminars and lectures on it. And it's, uh, it took quite a few years, but it finally went beyond the horse. Uh, it's uh, widespread use in circus animals today. Uh, and uh, uh, in the, yes, not in the cattle industry. I, I remember one ranch in Texas with uh, Angus cattle that contacted me and said, we're handling these calves as soon as they're born out in the, out on the open pastures. And uh, they're gentle to handle from then on. Wow. So it's uh, nature's power, wonderful, a wonderful phenomenon. And the reason it was so unknown and so rejected for so long, thousands of years, is simply because it doesn't apply to the human baby. We are a predator, we're not a prey species. Mm. So we imprint many weeks later, the child recognizes and memorizes the mother's face, but not at birth. But what they learn at, at, at the time of birth, what they see, it doesn't even have to be a lot thing. Uh, I've been shown on uh, clinics I've done, I've been shown a uh, full imprinted on a- uh, Wheelbarrow? A what? A wheelbarrow? Not a wheelbarrow, but it was a- Manure cart. A manure cart, yes. And I said, oh really? I said, how'd that happen? They said, well, uh, she was born in daylight and uh, our hired man just was wheeling the manure cart right past her nose. And when she was about five minutes old, and uh, he said, uh, she loves that manure cart. I said, really? So by now this foal was three or four months of age. And they called out to bring the cart. They wheeled the cart out and that foal just nickered and ran to the cart. That's how powerful it is. Oh, it, the tree leaves too. And, and there was one- The tree leaves. The what? The tree leaves, the trees. Oh yeah, I was, I was, I'd forgotten about that one. Yeah, there was, uh, a foal born on, in a windstorm under, under a tree outdoors. And uh, after I explained imprint training, the owner said, now I understand. Uh, uh, that colt was born in a windstorm under the tree uh, for just a violent shaking of the leaves. He says, it will leave its mom and go back to that tree. It always goes back to that tree. That's, a, that's how powerful it is. That's amazing. Yeah. And so you said that you had heard about it in dogs from this researcher and then you found it for the horse. And then you said, well, the, and the, the dog being a predator, you were probably the first to do it with a prey animal. Isn't that right? Well, well and give it a name. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's not only true of mammals, but it's also true in birds, for example, uh, Prey birds, uh, hawks, eagles, owls, uh, they imprint. And, uh, and the, uh, the, the prey animals, I, I, na I named the parrots as I meant the prey. Um, quail, pheasants, turkeys, chickens, uh, ducks and geese. Uh, the young, as soon as they come out of the egg, They've got to instantly recognize mom and follow her even into the water to stay alive. So it's it's just a miracle of nature, the it, of the uh, evolutionary process. And uh, uh, now I said that it was not a part of human culture, but in my extensive travels and teaching all over the world. I have learned there were certain primitive peoples who grew up with horses living in, in, right with them, living right with their uh, horses in particular that were onto imprint training. I discovered the Cherokee tribe, for example. Uh, a Cherokee told me that he was taught to do this by his grandfather. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. And uh, I have also seen a painting of a newborn foal in, a tar in an Arab tent, a Bedouin tent. Uh, yeah, I have a copy of it. 
and uh, the people are handling it. So then I, I discovered a tribe in uh, South America uh, that uh, did this. So people that actually lived in the field with, with their horses uh, picked up on this uh, much faster than uh, people who lived in a barn or the house and then went out to see the foal and uh, maybe the second day the foal was very fearful and uh, they said avoid handling them. I, I said I was taught both from my bachelor's degree in animal husbandry and my doctorate uh, I was taught uh, avoid handling the newborn foal if possible because you'll create problems but if you have to handle them, be as gentle as possible. And I never questioned that. It's, it seemed completely logical, but it's wrong. If they're uh, handled properly, um, the results are permanent. Now, we've raised a lot of mules and a lot of horses, and uh, I just lost my favorite equine of all time. We school. talked about that. Yeah. Years of age. Rode her up until the end. Uh, and she was an angel that whew, and never, I can never ever remember her doing something wrong towards a person or towards another horse. Uh, and of course, we imprint trained her. We even made a, a video of it. And uh, so, uh, I've done a couple of videos on it, uh, and uh, the Western Horseman book was no question that was the, the main reason this caught on because it's such a popular publication uh, company. And thanks to the editor at that time, who's retired now, Pat Close, she it made sense to her, although it didn't to a lot of people. Well, it's wonderful that she was progressive enough to notice. You know, since we're talking about your books, and I, I want to touch on the one that was, you said it was renamed, but it was said, it was the one about, um, I, even I even treat aardvarks. Yeah. Could you tell us about the early name and the later name? And then, and then I think the aardvark story is pretty cool, too, if you can include that. Well, the original name of the book was Most of My Patients Are Animals. And the reason for that is uh, I ended up with human patients, but I wasn't planning on it. For example, I remember uh, a call and a horse trainer that came limping out. Uh, and uh, he said, uh, Doc, uh, can I have some of that DMSO? I said, what for? Uh, oh, he said, Oh no, DMSO. My horse up in Central California, he's they say, they said he's lame. And I said, well, I said, you have to know what's causing the lameness. And uh, he finally confessed that he wanted to try it on his own. No, you, like, you told, he said you, it had some side effects. Yeah, I'd warned him about, about side effects. I was just joking, of course. Oh, I don't that's the side effects. Tell him. Huh? Tell him. What did I tell him? It affects your testosterone. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I said uh, it neutralizes your testosterone. <laughs> and, and so he said, oh. <laughs> now I said, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. No, he changed his I, mind about, about treating it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. But well, anyway. Yeah, I remember DMSO the first time that we used it and, and the guy, my trainer at the time said, be really careful because you will taste this yes, if that's you true. get it on your hands. And I went, oh, yeah, I'm like, I want to put on the gloves now before I go around that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah. You, if you handle it uh, without gloves, you can't taste it. So anyway, when it came time to republish that book, the... Uh, Amazon. Amazon, as a new publisher, said, uh, and I said, I'm going to make changes in the book. I'm going to add some stuff, I'm going to take some stuff out. Uh, and uh, they said, uh, 
that's fine. That's, that's fine. You can do that. They said, but we also want you to change the title, especially if you're changing chapters. And uh, uh, so I thought, what am I going to call this thing? So I thought about an incident that had happened in my practice. I got referred uh, by a lot of Los Angeles veterans for exotic animals because uh, most of them were not trained in them. I think today they are. Uh, but uh, so uh, when they were asked to treat something unusual, uh, a lot of them would decline it. It wasn't worth the time. And so uh, I, a lady called and she said, we're thinking of uh, buying an aardvark. And we called our vet and he said he, he didn't even know what an aardvark is. And then uh, we called several other vets and uh, n none of them knew. She says, so then we called the Griffith Park Zoo, uh, the vet. And he said, well, I can't do private work. I just work for the zoo. But he says, there is a vet in Thousand Oaks, which is only an hour's drive away. Uh, and that was, that's how she called me. So I thought that's inspired the title, the, the, the new title on the old book. Uh, yes, we treat aardvarks. <laughs> because what I told her is I've never treated an aardvark, but I said I've treated countless species that I have no prior, prior experience with, and that includes a variety of whales and dolphins for Pacific Ocean Park and countless wild species of every kind you could name. So I wouldn't hesitate to treat an aardvark. So she said, okay, we're going yeah, we're gonna to get the aardvark. She called me sometime later. Do you remember my conversation? I said, yes. And I said, it led to a change in a book title. She said, oh, really? Said, yes. So she says, anyhow, can you, I'm calling to make an appointment. I said, oh, you bought the aardvark. She said, no, we got a mountain lion instead. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh, my. So you had to treat the, the mountain lion. Oh, he treated, oh, a lot he of treated those. lots of those. Oh, that's, some, that's what, you know what, speaking of that, and, and I put out a picture of um, Southern California for, and I sent it out to all the folks that, that you know, were, were signed up for the call. And I showed where Thousand Oaks is. I, I don't know if I'm backward or forward on the screen, but to the, to the, to the west is Thousand Oaks. And then if you go over the hill, you end up in the, what is the San Fernando Valley and you get out to Burbank and then you get over to Los Angeles. Yeah. And then also I recall, cause as we talked about, I used to live in the Canal Valley. It's about eight miles the way the crow flies to the Malibu coast. And, yes. and then you get down to Santa Monica. So all of these are areas very approachable to you, but because you were the only veterinarian or the first veterinarian for a long time, in Thousand Oaks, and you told me about the fact that Thousand Oaks was where, a, or at least the Canal Valley, was where all these animals were being trained for Hollywood movies, right? So you became the veterinarian to the animal stars, isn't that right? Uh, yes, uh, when we moved here in 1957, it was, uh, very small town, agricultural community, uh, ranching, cattle ranching, uh, huge. There were thousands of cattle on the ranches all around our area. And um, there, of course, was the population of about 1,500 people, so they had dogs and cats. And uh, I saw the potential here. The only industry was the wild animal industry which located here because it was uh, easily commuting distance back in those days, no traffic with, for Hollywood. And you could pretty well order anything you want from an elephant to a crocodile, to a specific kind of crocodile, to any kind of snake in the world, a place that had hundreds of kinds of snakes. Bird Wonderland had hundreds of species of birds, all for um, the entertainment industry. And uh, so that's what I ended up with. Uh, I always had a, a preference for, for horses. I always loved horses, but I was doing everything. Uh, but the practice grew very rapidly. Uh, pretty soon, I, 
Bob Kine, a Kansas graduate, joined me, became a, throughout his life a friend and partner. Uh, then Larry Drescher, who now lives in Oregon. We're all retired now, uh, those of us who are still around. Jim Petty, who lives in Ventura. Uh, and uh, we had an annual internship program and we hired several other veterinarians, but uh, the practice had four equal owners. And uh, one day at a staff meeting, Dr. Petty says, the horse practice is growing at such a rate and such volume because of the subdividing, the community is subdividing. And so they're switching from ranch horses to uh, pleasure horses and stables opening up. Uh, I said, yeah, that's obvious. We're doing a lot of horse work. He said, I think one of us should kind of specialize in horses. This was at the midpoint of my career. Uh, my 15th year in Thousand Oaks. And they all looked at me. I said, wait a minute. I said, I love the variety in this practice. Uh, I never expected to create a practice like this. Uh, and, and Jim said, yes, but you are the only horseman. That is the only person who was a, a rider and had experience training horses and all that. So I told him, look, I'll tell you what. I said, I'm willing to do it for a year, mostly horse work. Not, a, not 100%, but mostly horse work. Uh, cattle work, we were, weren't getting much anymore because of the ranches, the subdividing. And I said, but I want you to promise me that if I'm not happy, that I'll go back to doing everything. Yeah, they agreed. 30 days later at our next staff meeting, I said, I want you to know that I'm a much happier person now. Because first of all, I love to work out of doors, especially in Southern California. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, I'm working exclusively out of doors, not in the hospital. And I said, and I'm working with horses, which I've always loved working with horses. So as far as I'm concerned, I don't mind doing this for the rest of my career. So for the rest of my career, I did 98, 96, 97% horse work. Wonderful. Wonderful. It, so let's, let's forward to today. You're 93 years old and I listened to Debbie and you talk about, because Debbie's just a few years younger at 87. And the two of you guys have an agenda that would exhaust people half your age. <laughs> and <laughs> One of the things that came up was I said, well, well, doctor, what are you working on now? And you said, well, Andrew, I would normally be public speaking because of COVID, you're not be able to speak, which is why I'm really excited tonight. You get to speak on, on this, but talk to us about, why don't you talk to us a little bit about what you're doing these days? Well, of course, with the, uh, with the pandemic, uh, that shut down a lot of our travel and a lot of our engagements. Uh, for example, Bishop Mule Days, which was one of our favorite annual rituals, was canceled because of the pandemic. And uh, so uh, we've had more time at home, uh, more time for me to write, because I, I, I still, I still write for some uh, publications. And uh, we do miss our travel because I, I retired from practice at 87 years of age because I was turning down invitations. At 87, younger, 60, 67. Huh? 67. No, 60, I was 60 when I retired. Okay. Okay. It was 1987. Oh. 1987, mm -hmm. I was 60 years of age and uh, I was getting so many invitations and the deal I had with my partners, one trip a, a month. And we've been all over the world on every continent. Teaching, it was mostly the, the imprint training that led to this uh, lecturing circuit. And I would, when they invited me, I would say, I'm willing to come talk uh, on horse behavior, including imprint training. 
but not exclusively. Only once did they turn that down. Uh, they said, no, we, we only want import learning. So I, I turned it down. And uh, the other people were very positive. They said, oh, great, that would be interesting. Uh, because I, f I feel that the infra training is just one phase of understanding horse behavior. And so uh, once we were free, the first thing we did is we went to Africa. One of the things. As soon as I retired. Yeah. Yeah, we, we went to... Uh, Kenya. Yeah, we went to Kenya and, and then went back a year later uh, on a lecture circuit. The first one was a, just a learning trip. The second one we were teaching. Wow. You know, we've been on, on every continent and uh, 51 trips to Hawaii. Only one, only <laughs> one did we pay our own way. And that was the last, the last, the last one. Years ago. We had 50 consecutive trips to Hawaii to, to teach and lecture horsemanship. That's amazing. What a, it's a, oh, it's a spectacular uh, career. Yeah, you know, it's wonderful. I, so, I miss Hawaii. I'd love to get invited. Yeah, we're all, we all miss Hawaii. We want to <laughs> open, open things open up. So, so, Doctor, one of the things going back to the revolution and what it means to mankind, the revolution horsemanship, um, as I was reading this in preparation for, you know, kind of reminding me of the book, um, which, by the way, and I, it, it, I have to tell everybody, this is a textbook that is used in some colleges for horsemanship. And I would recommend everybody on the, on the call, if you haven't opened up this book, it's got a forward by Hugh Downs. Um, and it's, of course, all about several clinicians that are all part of the, the revolution. But it is, it, here's the thing. I was reading it. This 2015, I mean, 20, 2005 title, today's, it's, it's 15 years later. And so many of the things are still ringing true. For example, you started to talk about the money that came into it. You started to talk about the internet. You started to talk about how very many more people are participating. Can you comment for us the current state of the revolution? and what you expect for the future of the revolution? Well, it will continue to grow and continue to spread because it works uh, as the educational level of people uh, con continuously improves in our society. Uh, they're receptive to uh, the, the words of educated people. And, uh, there, there will always be naysayers, always will be, towards any human concept. But it will, as I said, it's taken 50 years for widespread uh, acceptance. It's going to take, I'm estimating, another 50 years where it becomes generalized. Most people, when a foal is born, will take the time. Natural horsemanship. I asked about natural horsemanship. Yeah, talking about natural horsemanship, and uh, which is imprinting is part of it. That's why Pirelli became a supporter of it. But uh, it's, I don't know what more I can say. It's it's interesting because the, the horse has been, in some ways, an obsolete f form of human culture. It, it's it, in other words, life for humans would certainly go on without the horse today, but it's been the most important, I think, of all domestic animals because it gave man range of motion, ability to travel long distances at relatively high speed and learn from other uh, tribes. The tribes that didn't have horses didn't advance. Yeah, that's right. When, when the horse was not available to uh, primitive peoples, uh, it greatly hindered their advancement. You can just look, you know, just look at the history of mankind.
when we look at the beginning of the 20th century as the car and well first it was the, the the train and then we moved to the car and the horse began not being so required and you talk about in the book how the horse began to be more of a pet uh, more of a relationship um, mm -hmm. and people had a different need for the horse and of course today um, the horse is, is, is really contributing in so many ways. Can you comment on that? Yeah, and the role of the horse unquestionably uh, expanded throughout human history. And uh, today it's uh, primarily a, uh, what's the word, uh, a companion animal. Uh, people ride just like they like to ski. Debbie and I are lifetime passionate skiers. So we can identify with people that ride just as an outlet for their athletic ability. Uh, but there's more involved. Uh, the one relationship, the horse, the communication between uh, horse and rider. Not for everybody. We all, uh, as I said, the natural horsemanship movement is displacing other forms of horsemanship. And that's a worldwide phenomenon. It's displacing it. It's a reflection upon the educational level of the, of the uh, society that it's in and upon the uh, Culture? Yes, the culture, what, what their attitude, because I remember when, if somebody was too solicitous to the horse, too gentle, too kind, you get criticized. Happened to me. It happened to me. I remember even 20 years ago. And it, was, it wasn't long, and thankfully it wasn't long before I found natural horsemanship through Pirelli and, and continued. And you're absolutely right. It's been life-changing for both my wife and I, and probably for everybody on the call. So I'd like to switch to some of the questions that we have, if we will, doctor. Um, okay. And the last question first, because this gentleman who's asking this question is a president of a 501c3 that provides um, their, uh, oh, I think on the order of 2,000 rides a year of horse therapy. Um, his name's Mark Kerstig, and he asked me, how do you feel about horses being used for therapeutic riding and therapies involving horses and humans? Well, with proper guidance and professional experience, uh, it's a proven value uh, to patients. Obviously, uh, it can also be a disaster if uh, the horse isn't well trained and the person is not also well trained in how to handle it. But assuming that uh, both horse and, and, uh, and rider get proper guidance, uh, we know. Uh, how effective horses can be in people's lives. Well, and to that end, it's interesting that you note that because I know, for example, uh, Mark's wife, Landa, went through an extensive training with Nara, and she also has her horses trained. And in fact, the Pirelli Foundation, which I'm involved in, has given a grant to One Step Closer of Morgan Hill as we give grants to several organizations and they're hiring David Lichman to train all of the, um, the volunteers. And so, um, in fact, um, you know, Dave is asking to ask a question. And so since I mentioned him, um, there are several groups of Pirelli Foundation, the, the Pirelli Natural Horsemanship, the instructors and, um, people that are part of what used to be NARA, now it's PATH, P-A-T-H, are putting in place that environment for them to succeed. But isn't it wonderful what an impact that you've had in terms of 
making all, a lot of this available to us to know what the horse can do. And I guess to back to Mark's question, do you, why do you think that the horse might be in a, in a unique position to provide therapy? Well, that, obviously, if you look at, at, through my eyes, my ex lifetime experience, bonding people with a, an infinite variety of species of uh, other creatures uh, is often amazing. Uh, how effectively people bond with animals and communication between them. Uh, I would certainly, I'd certainly rate the dog ahead of the horse numerically, wouldn't you? And say more people are strongly bonded to uh, a dog in the house. Uh, I know there are people who are strongly <laughs> cats, for example. Uh, I'm not critical because I like all my animals. Uh, we saw your but, dog. We saw your dog come onto the show here. <laughs> we lost you. We lost you. I got well, right. <laughs> I was just saying that we saw your dog come on to the show just a minute ago. That was fabulous. He loves Zoom. We have family meetings on Zoom, so he loves Zoom. Uh, yeah. How fun. Well, anyways, we were talking about the cat and the dog. And but, so, if I, oh, there he is. Awesome. He loves Zoom. Here, oh, look at that. He does. He know, Hi there. What's his name? Oliver. <laughs> Oliver, how are you? How fascinating. Hi, Oliver. <laughs> so, Doctor, you were talking about the cat and the dog being, you know, bonded to people. I, my cat was on earlier, uh, and, uh, and of course. Um, but to the horse, then, Ben. What, what was the question? <laughs> well, the question is to the horse and, and the horse's relationship with people, and we're and we're wondering, can you talk about how, why it's so great at therapy? Well, I, I've thought about this stuff. You look at other species, um, the food animal species, sheep, cattle, goats, swine. Yes, there's people that are tremendously attached uh, to individuals or groups of these animals. However, their main function, their main function was food, providing food for mankind, uh, but above all else. The main function of the horse was to provide transportation. That's not the same as food, although many cultures did use the horse for food extensively. That wasn't their main purpose to mankind. It, w it was transportation. And it gave early man, if you think about it, the idea of traveling huge distances uh, and not fatiguing it was so exciting and inspiring to people in, in primitive societies. So the horse has been a very, very important species. And I don't have to mention what the rule is warfare. Mm -hmm. Well, warfare is a part of human nature. And uh, if you had two tribes and they were in war with each other, and one tribe had horses and the other didn't, guess who had the advantage? Mm -hmm. So, uh, this a, a lot of ways that the, the, the horse can be valued. And uh, Having, I started working with draft horses in my teens, uh, plowing fields. And the big, best time of day, that was a dollar a day was what I got paid. The best time of day was riding in at the end of the day on, on those draft horses. Wow. Riding back into the farm. And, uh, so I can identify with the feeling of a primitive society, which uh, had horses and kept them for whatever purpose. And uh, a little boy, 
bonded with a newborn foal. And then about 90 days later, the foal outraged the kid. And he got, up, he got up on its back. And dad came out and said, oh, for heaven's sakes, I never thought about that. Hey, mom, come out here and see this. I just figured out a way that we can whip the neighbors. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh, that's funny. Hey, doctor, I got David Lichman all ready to go, and he's got his cat. So there David, he is. Yeah, it's it's Pepe. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> the uh, I've I've learned a tremendous amount of of of, of about the horses in the world from Pat Pirelli and been given invaluable experiences traveling around the world, teaching his program and interacting with people. But I think one of the highlights of my time with Pat was that he introduced me to you two. And the, the times that we weren't always uh, that often that we got together, but when we did get together, I probably never laughed as hard in my life. So I, I remember fondly uh, all the times we spent, and I'm grateful for Pat that he introduced me to you. Oh, thanks, it's Dave. It's mutual. <laughs> we always remember you. We have, we have. I mean, there's so many stories, but I'll tell you, I'll tell one, and it'll also be maybe a little plug for your uh, cartoon books. Uh, I, I assume you're still selling some of those books. Yes. Good. Uh, I encourage you to buy them. Uh, I, I bought the whole set of them and I sat in bed with uh, my wife, Nancy, and, and I would be just in tears laughing so hard. And then there'd be one, I wouldn't understand it. And I'd ask her what it was at some veterinary term in there. And it became even more funny. Uh, but uh, so I knew this uh, about Bob and, and uh, so the, the, the humor and also the artistic ability to draw these cartoons. And uh, so we were having dinner one night in Sacramento and <clears throat> with my son who was very young. And I, and I said, maybe Bob will draw a little cartoon for you on a napkin. And mm -hmm. Bob says, what would you like? And Sam says, a dinosaur. So Bob proceeds to draw on the napkin, a dinosaur like you would see in the museum, just bones. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so Sam says to him, he says, no, 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 younger. So, <laughs> so, so Bob takes the he takes the napkin back and he draws a picture of an egg. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I encourage you to have a look at the cartoon books and, and God bless you, Bob. What you've done for all of us has been fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Hey, Cezanne, I'm going to put you on the spot. Where are you? Are, are you? Can you unmute? Are you there? Yeah. No, no, not you. Yeah. Cezanne? Did I, I may not have given her. Hello. Notice. There you are, Cezanne. Huh? Yeah. Let's, uh, let's have a question from you. Uh, I came up with a couple of them, but um, I'm just going to ask the one. Um, how about after imprinting, uh, do you have any guidelines for how much time someone should work with their foal? Well, one of the things I liked about imprint training is, is it saved me so much time later on mm -hmm. uh, because uh, if I wanted them to learn something, it came much faster because the fear element was gone and the attachment and respect was, it was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that alone made it worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah, that's, so there are a lot of advantages in imprint training. As I said, I just recently lost a 33-year-old mule that was the second mule ever done, to my knowledge, at least with my method. Uh, the first one uh, was also a very successful career. It's my show uh, mule. Show mule, yes. English and Western. She, she had a great, great career. This one, uh, we never did anything with her. Just, just she was just a saddle mule, and uh, for the well, last she knew how to rope. Hmm? You could rope on her. Oh, you could rope on her. Yeah. Uh, the last ten years, uh, she was just my trail, trail horse. I had 
complete confidence in her. And I knew that she'd take care of me and I never had to worry. <laughs> I remember one of uh, something that happened maybe a year ago, but not, not much longer than that. Debbie and I were coming back in from a trail ride. Yeah, Debbie was ahead of me on her gelding and we're almost home. We only had a couple hundred yards left to go to, to get home. And off to the right were two deer, two does. Debbie's gelding didn't, never saw it. He just kept right on going and I'm riding behind. So I'm completely relaxed because we're just following, I'm just following Debbie. And uh, probably due to age, my legs were aching. So I, I, took, them, I took my feet out of the stirrups. I didn't need an air for the last, the last couple hundred yards. And that mule, 30, 33, or 32, 33 years old at the point, sorry, saw those two deer and the, the gelding ahead of her didn't. And she spun. <laughs> <laughs> she spun. I didn't lose my seat. But I was now faced in the back direction. And then she didn't move. She didn't move. But her ears told me, something's over there. So first thing I did was I slipped my feet back into the stirrups. <laughs> <laughs> and then slowly turned around. And we both saw the deer. And I said, oh, is that just deer? She's seen deer all her life. And she said, <sighs> Yeah. I'll never forget that experience. That's wonderful. Cezanne, have you got another for him? Go ahead. Oh, I was I was curious if you if you'd heard about the Madigan technique with the squeeze, the squeezing technique for the dummy foals, mm -hmm. and if it changes the um the full imprinting. Well he Bob has said many times that he's never had a imprinted full with dummy syndrome. Oh, really? Whether that's coincidence or because they've had the, the procedure. Yeah. Do you think that the dummy foals are, per, well, like, I'm why do you think the dummy foals happen? I'm familiar with Dr. Madigan's method, and of course, yeah. it's well documented, it works. Uh, as Debbie said, I have done all of our own foals, uh, I have supervised clients doing their foals and instructing them how to do it. Yeah. Uh, I've even had classes where we arranged to have newborn foal. Uh, and in all that experience, I, I never had a dummy. Yeah. I've seen them. I've had them in practice. Now, whether that was a factor in diminishing the incidence, I cannot say. Yeah, I wouldn't. I'd be afraid to make that comment because uh, when I say I've done lots of folds, we're talking about hundreds of folds, not thousands. Mm -hmm. So uh, whether that's a factor or not, I don't know. But yeah, I'd never heard of it until I went to um, Atwood and that saw Dr. Madigan and saw, saw the squeezing and stuff, and I, I. Just curious because I'd never actually heard about dummy fold before that. I'm sorry. Does, does does Dr. Madigan think it's helpful in preventing dummy folds? Oh, I have no i I have no idea. I, I would never say that because I I don't have the volume of experience to take. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, not surprising that. I've never seen one because the dummy folds are a fairly rare incident in, in uh, folds. It, it is not a, a very small percentage of folds yeah. ever turn out. So I, I would never make a statement that you can pr prevent dummy fold syndrome by imprint training. Yeah. I, I don't have a st statistical base for that. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, I have a question because my wife asked it the other day when I was asking, uh, what would you like me to ask Dr. Miller? And she said, well, Dr. Miller, obviously, you know that you ha there's a difference between the horse that is 
naturally trained or traditionally trained to the veterinarian. But do you notice any difference in the way that the horse heals as a result of the horse having been naturally trained? Oh, yes. Heal? Yeah. Huh? Where they heal, where they recover. Oh, does it speed recovery? Is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, does it influence it? Have you noticed that the horse, yeah. Treatment, so much easier, which was for my, the thing that inspired me most to share the information with my clients is I knew from my own three folds over a three year period that they were flawless patients. You could uh, hammer on their feet, rasp their feet, pass a stomach tube up the nostril, uh, put something down in the ears, uh, put handle their mouth, uh, and so on. He wants to know whether he speeds up healing. Huh? If it helps heal. I can't say that it would speed healing. It would facilitate treatment. That sounds good. One of the guys, uh, Ravs, was asking about your experience teaching other veterinarians. A lot well, that. yes, I've, I've spoken to a, a lot of veterinarians, but uh, watching the younger generation of veterinarians, uh, they are so quick to sedate and tranquilize. And I, nobody can be more grateful for those drugs than me, because uh, I remember when we didn't have them, and we've got these wonderful drugs that facilitate everything we do with the horse because they just immobilize the horse. But I know that there, it's being used places where it's really not necessary, but it, it does save time. And uh, time is money in the practice of veterinary medicine. I had a question. This is fun, Bob, uh, Bob and Debbie. Uh, Linda Pirelli asked, what is your secret to life and to marriage? Because uh -huh. you are such a great example for, for all of us. Besides perseverance? <laughs> well, I think it's got a lot to do with uh, the same concept as natural horsemanship. And that is attitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can be, uh, we're all stressed throughout life. We have minor stretches, stresses every day, major stresses, uh, incurable stresses and uh, incurable stresses. But if we allow the stress to uh, overwhelm our behavior, our courtesy, our consideration for another person, that's detrimental to a close relationship. So it's very important to be a considerate, humane, kind. Grateful. Grateful, yes, grateful. To appreciate. That's wonderful. Appreciate it. Now, that doesn't mean that every marriage is destined for success uh, because if one or both individuals lack those properties there's going to be trouble so to me it's uh, the same quality that goes into adopting humane kind considerate and effective horsemanship goes into building a kind considerate and effective marriage that That's is wonderful I That's what that. the title on the book, what it means to mankind. That's what I meant with that subtitle, that if you apply the principles of the horse to apply our human relationships with our family, our colleagues, our friends, nice. our neighbors, our bosses, uh, it's going to make for a better life. I right. love it. Hey, what? Linda, Linda yeah. Pirelli. Um, wonderful. I, yeah, isn't that wonderful? Uh, and I did ask those questions on your behalf, but... I'd like you to, to kind of close tonight with your question. Uh, well, I think you asked my question, but um, Bob and Debbie, I think you left one thing out on that beautiful list. 
and that was a sense of humor. Oh, because yeah. I remember, I remember spending a week with you guys in Spain, and the jokes never stopped. I mean, till the moment we got off the plane, we were still trying to outdo each other with jokes. And your sense of humor, and even just watching Debbie, you know, she's heard a lot of your stories before, and the smiles and enthusiasm with which she supports you is just like. The question is, a sense of humor is a great asset in life, no question about it. You know, after that trip, even at night, we'd wake up in the middle of the night answering some of the questions we were we had. Like, we were playing one game, the game we were playing. Call with no arms, you know, that game. No arms, no legs, I know. I mean, we'd wake up in the middle of the night for weeks playing that. <laughs> we were getting emails back and forth coming up with new ones. It was hilarious. Anyway, so I just love you both so much. You're so inspiring. Thank you. It's been too long since we've seen you. Yes. The we most popular thing you can say is, is you're just as pretty as you were years ago, and we've got to know yeah. you pretty well. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, there's a, a lot to be said for failing eyesight, but thank you, Bob. <laughs> oh, how wonderful. Well, the book that we talked about tonight is 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 the revolution in horsemanship and what it means to mankind. And of course, my cat's helping me now and the dog's helping you guys. Yes. <laughs> uh, Bob, it's been wonderful for me to have this book as a reference because we're trying to unite this part portion, fortunately growing portion of the world that are following the revolution. Um, we're, we're doing it at Pirelli Foundation. They're doing it at uh, the International Horsemanship Association. They're doing it in a, in a lot of places with under a lot of brands. And you helped define it for us. Um, and I think that all of us that are on the call for the rest of our lives will be soldiers. And, and um, the term I want to use are those that are carrying on this revolution. and 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 benefiting from the revolution i want to thank you so much for your for your time tonight for your lifetime contribution i hope we'll get to bring you back on again another time it's been fabulous and in closing just want to ask you do you have anything you'd like to share with us before we go anything you'd like to share no <laughs> it's, your, it's your time <laughs> Oliver might have something. Oliver says yes. Thank Oliver you. Oliver says yes. Oliver. Who's this? Who's, who's that? Hi, Oliver. Hey, Oliver, you there, buddy? His, his ears are standing up. <laughs> he's a television addict, also. Yeah, he. A complete he, addict. He's addicted to television. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, my cat, my my cat thinks that walking back and forth whenever I'm on a call is the right thing. And David, the same thing. We heard Linda's dogs barking in the background. We all love our pets, and we love the influence that you've given to us and the contribution you've made over a lifetime. I want to thank you so much on behalf of the Bay Area Savvy Players, on behalf of all the organizations, all the professionals, and and uh, horse lovers that are on the call. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Miller and Debbie, of course, too. Thank you. Very fortunate people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I love it. Wonderful. Lots of clapping. And we will. We look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you again. Have a good night. Because you spoke the language of love. Love you guys. <laughs> <laughs>